I'm here today to talk about whether or not states should legalize commercial surrogacy. Uh, this is a topic that many people have taken an unclear message from. We have these from a child rights side groundbreaking documents, the 2018 UN Special Rapporteur Report. Uh, we have as well the 2021 Verona Principles. We have the CHIP UNICEF statement. And because those are finely tuned legal analysis, uh, which I've helped craft parts of them, I was one of the core expert members of the Verona Principles. And because we tried very hard to stick close to what the texts tell us we can do, the text being the optional protocol on the sale, the CRC and so forth, perhaps our message was not as clear as it could be. But from my point of view, overwhelmingly, states should be very cautious about legalizing commercial surrogacy. Those documents open up just a very narrow window and send a message that insofar as commercial surrogacy is active in the world today, almost all of the forms that it takes right now uh, from the different states that do permit it do constitute sale under even a very cautious interpretation. So if you look at the uh, sale concept from the optional protocol on sale, it's very simple if you simplify it. It's transfer of a child for payment. Now we know with commercial surrogacy, we always have payment. Transfer of a child means either legal transfer, parentage, parental responsibility, or transfer of the physical custody or of the child. We have that as well. The big issue with sale and commercial surrogacy has been for what is the payment for? And I'm going to go over some of the claims that have been made to say that commercial surrogacy is not sale and try to explain the narrow window that was opened up, which frankly has not been taken by states for the most part. Essentially, the main argument made is that the payment is for gestational services uh, and it's not for transfer of the child. Uh, I want to play a little intuitive, uh, you know, I'm a law professor, we call it hypotheticals. So hypothetical, which is to ask this, if the surrogate mother were to go through all of her obligations as to accepting pregnancy, going through all nine months childbirth and were to not transfer the child to the intending parents, would the surrogate mother have fulfilled the arrangement and any obligations that flow from that arrangement? If the answer is no, she hasn't fulfilled the, the arrangement yet, then it is sale because then she's being paid for transfer. Uh, and so I think it's fair to say that the way that most of the commercial surrogacy arrangements are made, there is the contractual or non-contractual, but yet expectation that she will transfer and she must transfer and she hasn't fulfilled the arrangement if she doesn't. And so that is why, although we put this narrow window in place, which creates the possibility that she could be paid for gestation and childbirth, but not paid for transfer, what that requires is that the surrogate mother have an absolute choice when she gives birth uh, to transfer or not to transfer. And I think what you see in system after system after system is that the rights of the child, not just not to be sold, but the rights of the child as to identity rights, information about identity, best interests of the child uh, as a fundamental precept from beginning to end, best interests of the child review, uh, protection against, against uh, unsuitable persons, uh, being able to parent them, all those things go out the window. They're just not the concern because essentially commercial systems adhere to the needs of the paying customer. So again and again, what we've seen with commercial surrogacy is that the interrelated rights of the child are not first and foremost What's first and foremost is making the customer happy. And what the customer wants is not to be subjected to suitability review, not to be subject to a best interest of the child review, uh, not to be concerned about the possibility of the surrogate mother changing her mind. What the intending parent wants is it's my child from the beginning. And that's what systems give them. And that setup is totally incompatible with the child rights setup. It reduces the child effectively to the product of a market mechanism. Now, this idea of a market mechanism is most clearly stated without embarrassment here in the US. 
uh, where I'm talking to you from. So uh, I find it astonishing sometimes how uh, people outside of the US sort of rationalize away the blatantly commercial approach here. So when the American Bar Association, which is the largest lawyer organization and in, in, in effect represents intermediaries, uh, tried to lobby the US government in a very public way as to what we want, they said very, very clearly several things. They said, this is a market. And they said essentially that any attempt to regulate the market is misplaced. So the ABA is not just saying don't prohibit commercial surrogacy, they're saying don't regulate commercial surrogacy, that any interference with the market is a mistake. Uh, in addition to that, what we see typically in contracts from say California is that they are explicitly contractual and the surrogate mother undergoes contractual obligations to transfer and to facilitate transfer. So that's not left to chance, okay? The ultimate concern about legalizing a globalized system of commercial surrogacy is that we are undermining the child rights presuppositions and gains that we've labored so hard to do. Uh, the essential insight of child rights is that the child is a human person and as a human person has human rights. So children's rights are human rights. A system in which the child is the end product of a commercialized marketplace to satisfy the wishes of a customer, however sympathetic we are to that customer, however well-intended they are, simply cannot be a system based on the rights of the child. The child should not be the ultimate product in that sense. And that's the way these systems work because the intending parent is the paying customer and therefore the intermediaries gravitate towards the wishes of that person. I think that if we go down through the different commercialized systems, we can see that they have not functioned in a child rights way. So in the US, which is the high end of the market, I used to talk about the $100,000 baby. Now it's more like the $200,000 baby. Uh, and in that context, the states that have specifically legalized commercial surrogacy explicitly say no best interest of the child review at any stage not just none after birth, none before birth, no suitability review, okay? Uh, that the payment, once it's made and once the contract is made means that the surrogate mother has absolutely no rights to that child throughout the pregnancy uh, and at birth, that she is in essence reduced to a mechanism to deliver a child for another. And there's no question of her ever having parentage or parental responsibilities. Uh, in, in other words, the transfer of the child legally takes place when she signs the contract and when pregnancy ensues. That's the transfer. If you move to a system like Ukraine, the middle income, and also in that instance, we saw the same kind of pattern where intermediaries craft a system in which the surrogate mother has no ability to assert any kind of parentage or any kind of uh, parental responsibility. And where again, the system is basically saying intended parents come to Ukraine, we cost less than the US. This is the market-based system we have, you know, that's what we're competing on cost. Uh, and, you know, the, and you don't have to worry about suitability review. You don't have to worry about these things. Just come to Ukraine, you'll get a child. And it's quite clear, this is a market for children looked at objectively, okay? Then you have the developing country end of the market. India, Cambodia, Thailand, parts of Mexico. And this has been an in and out thing because what's happened in those countries is again, in a scenario where you have comparatively wealthy people coming from, for these developing countries, very wealthy intending parents, and they have intermediaries interacting with the intending parents. It is quite clear that again, the intermediaries are selling a low cost market for children and they're selling it by minimizing the rights of the child as well as minimizing as well as those of the of the surrogate mother commercial systems don't protect the vulnerable commercial systems protect the paying customer and so uh some of the other arguments that would minimize the nature of sale also would decimate the very concept of sale so for example sometimes it is said that it's not sale of a child because uh, we're making the arrangement before a child exists. Uh, again, we in the child rights field do not like to get into the business of saying when a child exists, but if you posit 
that a child exists at birth, that's fine. But then are you saying that it's okay to make an arrangement with a pregnant woman for the sale of her to be born child and that that's okay under the optional protocol because the child isn't born yet? And allowing the pre-production sale of human children earlier on this assembly line type thing would essentially be saying that we have legitimized baby farming as long as you enter into the contract before the baby is made. Open gaping holes in the norm against the sale of children that in the long term couldn't be confined to surrogacy at all. They would devastate our ability to make, make various forms of illegal adoption baby farming and so forth against the law. They would normalize uh, commercialized context for family formation.